Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the launch of the landmark edition of Thomas Wharton's Ice Fields. Uh, before I introduce the event, uh, I'd like to celebrate that Glass Bookshop is based in Miskwichi, Oskaigen, Treaty 6, Edmonton, Alberta. Treaty 6 stretches from the foothills of the Rocky Mountains to the western borders of the province, commonly known as Manitoba. Over 70 First Nations reside within the territory, including the Nehewak, Sutina, Anishinaabe, Nakota Sioux, Nitsitipi, Dene, Inuit, and it is also the homeland of the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. One way for us at Glass Bookshop to honor our treaty obligations is to work to support Indigenous sovereignty, and so we will continue to be donating percentage of book, event book sales to the Back to the Land Too Fast, Too Furious project run by Molly Swain and Chelsea Vowell. This project seeks to build a feminist Indigenous culture and language revitalization community space in Lac St. Anne that centers Indigenous LGBTQ and Two-Spirit folks to have access to land, teaching, ceremony, and community. They have already secured 160 acres of land in Lac St. Anne County, and additional funds will build essential infrastructure to see the project through. We're also pleased to partner with a wonderful indie bookshop for this event, uh, Shelf Life Books. Shelf Life acknowledges that they are on the lands of the Treaty 7 people, the Blackfoot from Siksika, Ganai, and Pikani, the Dene Sarsi from Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda from Morley, the Bearspaw, Chiniki, and the Wesley First Nations. They also walk in the footsteps of the Métis people from Region 3, Métis Nation of Alberta. Uh, my name is Matthew Stepanek, and alongside Jason Purcell, I manage Glass Bookshop, which is an independent bookstore in Edmonton that focuses on writing from queer and racialized authors, as well as the independent presses who publish their work, like the incredible New West Press, who uh, has brought you uh, Tom's book tonight. So thank you everyone for joining us over Zoom for this launch and reading uh, with Tom, who's actually my old creative writing prof. So um, I feel like I wanted to make a couple of jokes at his expense because, you know, that's how what he did to me when I was a student. Um, but I'm going to be very kind to you tonight, Tom, and not, you know, um, I'll save my material for when we're doing like the 50 year anniversary of Ice Fields. That's when I think you'll be ready to hear it. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're just here to celebrate the launch of this new edition of this highly lauded novel, Ice Fields. And um, many of you may not know that I actually had a really fun role of working with this book um, because the publisher had to scan the physical copy of Tom's first book because they did never had a digital file for it. Um, and that led to a bunch of like weird errors and spelling mistakes and the computer recognized the letter R is like two separate letters. So I was the one who went through and like copy edited and found all the mistakes. So um, I apologize if there are still some like weird errors in it. I think I caught them all, but you know what? And I never heard back from Matt or Claire about it. So I feel like it, it looks beautiful, but um, it was good. It was good. Okay, Claire's giving me the thumbs up. So um, that was fun. So that's kind of an extra special step for how this book happened. Um, you know, when you're working with something that you know, it was a little bit pre -com, um, our computer publishing age. Um, and I'm just here for the beginning to um, introduce you to your true and much more dazzling and special host for the evening. Um, so, Paul, um, so yeah, so without further ado, I'm going to welcome Suzette Meyer uh, to uh, the Zoom stage as uh, she is the author of five novels, including Monoceros, which was awarded the Relit Award the City of Calgary W.O. O, w o Mitchell Award and was long listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize. Her most recent novel is Dr. Edith Vane and the Hairs of Crawley Hall. She teaches creative writing at the University of Calgary. Uh, please welcome Suzette. Okay, thank you so much. Um, just let me figure this out here. Okay, so Tom uh, Wharton suggested that before we begin, and I absolutely agree, that we just take a moment to remember Douglas Barber, a wonderful poet, editor, and founding member of New West Press who recently passed away. Doug was with New West Press from its inception. In fact, initial funding for the press was a $500 loan from Doug in 1978. He served as the board president for many years, supported New West Press for many more in every possible way imaginable. And indeed three New West books being published this season were ones that Douglas Barber edited. We miss you, Doug. 
sorry. Okay, and now on to ice fields. <laughs> it is my great, great honor to introduce Tom Wharton tonight at this event and at this launch of a new edition of Ice Fields. And I think I was asked to introduce Tom because I knew him way back when before he was famous. Uh, I knew him in the early 1990s when he and I were part of a group of rookie student writers in Rudy Weeb's last graduate creative writing seminar at the University of Alberta. And I would like to think that I was there at the first glimmers of ice fields when Tom first began writing it, first began writing the manuscript, and that he owes all of ice fields success to me as his fellow student. But that would be a lie, and that would be 100% wrong. So here's the truth. Ice Fields exploded onto the literary landscape when it was first published in 1995. It was a CBC Canada Reads 2008 pick and a People's Choice winner. It won the Grand Prize and Banff National Park Award at the 1995 Banff Mountain Book Festival. It won the Henry Kreisel Award Best First Book Award and the 1996 Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best First Book in the Canada and Caribbean Division. The novel was shortlisted for the Boardman Tasker Prize in Mountain Literature, and it was chosen as the 1998 Grant McEwen College Book of the Year. Tom Wharton was even photographed doing a snow angel in People Magazine. Ice Fields was Tom's first major publication in what would be a hugely successful and varied writing career. Reading Ice Fields now in 2021, it's striking how the novel predicts the surge of interest in the area of eco-criticism, given how in the early 1990s, the threat of climate change and global warming was only just beginning to enter public awareness. And the belief at the time, the general belief at the time was that climate change would be a problem for people 100 years from now to worry about, not something we'd have to deal with in our lifetimes. Ice fields was prescient, told the future. Glaciers all over the world are melting and dying with increasing frequency due to climate change. But the optimist in me, after reading Tom's book, hopes that this new edition of Ice Fields might serve as a literary kick in the pants in the effort to arrest climate change. Ice Fields is a beautifully written book. It is an essential book. Please join me in welcoming Thomas Wharton. Tom, you're muted. There, how's that? Is that better? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Suzette. Um, you were important in the early days of Ice Fields because when something really sucked, you guys told me. So <laughs> a lot of the stuff that got cut out was, was cut out because of that class. So yeah, that was important. Um, yeah, I, oh man, I, I don't know what to say. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, but yeah, I feel really blessed because, uh, you know, when I first published this book, I, I thought, you know, if my mom likes it, then I'll feel good. You know, that, that's a, that'll be success. And uh, she liked it, I think. Um, uh, and then, you know, uh, other people started to read it. People in, who lived in the mountains said that they, they, they really liked it. Um, they wanted to talk about it. Um, and, it, and yeah, it just sort of grew and grew and it allowed me to travel all over the world eventually and meet all kinds of amazing people. So I, you know, I just can't believe it. And, and that it's being published again, uh, I think is in large part due to those readers who kept the book alive, you know, for 25 years. My kids grew up in the meantime um, and all of these wonderful readers who, you know, a lot of them got in touch with me and wanted to talk about the book. And, uh, I think they had a lot to do with with bringing us here today. So I want to thank my readers for sure. Um, a few other people I really want to thank: uh, Glass Bookshop, Shelf Life Books for being the uh, the official um, booksellers for this event tonight. So, and uh, everybody at New West Press, Matt, Claire, Carolina, and Christine for being a, a really uh, tight ship and and really helping me through this whole process. Uh, thank you, of course, Suzette, for your for your afterward, your wonderful afterward, which, uh, you know, it's got a lot of great things to say, but it also made me laugh out loud the first time I read it with, with your memories of, of being in that class. <laughs> Rudy's last uh, graduate seminar. Yeah, there were only four of us. So there was a lot of 
of Rudy to go around for each one of us. Yeah. Um, and uh, Smaro as well, Smaro Cambarelli, thank you for both of you for, for all the wonderful uh, DVD extras, if I can call them that, for this new edition, the afterword and then the interview. Uh, just bring a whole new perspective to the book, which is wonderful. Thanks to Natalie Olson for the fantastic new cover and the book design. I think it's beautiful. I was, I was really, really happy to see that. I got to make some new maps for the book. That was nice as well. And New West also allowed me to just tweak a few sentences here, sentences there, which isn't normally something that a writer gets to do with a book that's 25 years old is to fix their mistakes. Right, so I got a chance to to do a little bit of that, and um, I, I'm I'm quite happy about it. So, um, yeah, uh, I think I think I want to start by with the glacier angle of things, uh, like you did, Suzette. Um, you know, the 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 idea sort of at the back of this book is all the time is that these these glaciers are volatile, fluid things. They surge forward and then they melt. And you know, the characters in the book realize that, well, they're really melting, right? They're they're receding now. This is a time of glacier recession. And, and when's it gonna end? How is it gonna end? Um, and that's obviously something that we're all, you know, very much concerned about right now. So what I thought I would, well, what I did was uh, I thought, well, I should read a couple of those glacier sections from the book where people talk about the glaciers. But when I ran, went through the book, I realized. They're all very short. Uh, so what I did instead was, in the spirit of this book, which was kind of written in fragments, I just went through the book and I took out little bits and pieces about the ice, about glaciers, put them all together, rearranged them to create a kind of uh, found poem out of my own novel about glaciers. And that's what I'm gonna start by reading. All right, and I have to start like the novel itself does with uh, Michael Ondaatje's wonderful words from his book, Coming Through Slaughter, as if everything in the world is the history of ice. I sometimes have the feeling the ice is alive. The neve, the high plain of snow and ice from which the glaciers descend, cannot be seen from the valley. It must be imagined. Squinting, he picked out the crevasses and ice falls of Arcturus Glacier. From this distance, they seemed only delicate spidery wrinkles in pale blue silk. Above them gleamed the white rim of the Neve, where the glacier spilled from a gap between the flanking peaks, a slender curve of burning snow. Stones, fragments of a lost continent, lie scattered in the dirty snow of the till plain. A shattered pallet at my feet, the mad artist having just stalked away. Gray breccia flecked with acid green and primrose yellow. Pockmarked slabs into which powder of burnt sienna has been ground. The many colored constellations of lichen growth. Rocks splattered with crimson and cadmium orange. The purple and white veins of limestone. The enchantment of these mute fragments is undeniable. I sometimes have the feeling the ice is alive. A moraine is rock debris deposited by the receding ice, a chaotic jumble of fragments from which history must be constructed. Climbing the ice fall. After an hour, the sun has risen overhead and climbs with him, now an enemy. The ice weakens, sloughs off its brittle outer skin, releasing itself into liquid all around him. He is climbing an emerging waterfall. There can be little doubt the glacier is at present retreating. The logical next step is to determine as closely as possible the flow rate and the average yearly amount of recession. By doing so, one should be able to predict the time it would take an object embedded at a particular location in the ice to travel to the terminus and melt out. Frank Trast's guided walking tours to the Alpine Meadows and the Arcturus Glacier, starting from the chalet lobby at 7.15 a.m. sharp. 
led by experienced mountaineers who can answer all questions. Please consult beforehand with the management concerning appropriate dress. All other supplies and a luncheon will be provided. We can take you above the clouds at a very reasonable charge and let you touch a real glacier, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. Nunatak, an island of rock rising above the surrounding ice upon which one may discover the tenuous presence of life. As I watch, a wide crater-like depression on the glacier slowly fills with water. By early evening, it has become a lake, perfectly transparent, filled with the purest water on earth. There are no fish in its depths, no sedges or grasses along the shore, no geese, no shorebirds gather here at dusk. Each night, as the meltwater lessens, the lake subsides. In the morning, it has vanished again. As the glacier flows forward, its topography will inevitably change and the lake will vanish. For that reason, its ephemerality, I see no reason to give this body of water a name. It will remain the ideal lake. I sometimes have the feeling the ice is alive. In certain rare conditions of wind and sunlight, glacial ice evaporates immediately without passing through the liquid stage. This is called sublimation, a more refined form of melting. The phenomenon is often accompanied by a rhythmic crackling, as if invisible feet were stepping across the ice. The sun here sends forth billowing streamers and curtains of radiance. On the earth, this light acts strangely. It has substance, life, it bobs, spills, dances, changes direction. It appears and disappears suddenly, changing the color and shape of objects in front of your eyes. When the temperature drops at dusk to below zero, all the streams on the glacier surface cease to flow. Everywhere, the ice bristles up with glittering frost needles as the melted and now refreezing surface water dilatates. A garden of tiny ice flowers seems to be growing all around me. I sometimes have the feeling the ice is alive. Glacial ice is not a liquid, nor is it a solid. It flows like lava, like melting wax, like honey, supple glass, fluid stone. To watch it flow, one must be patient. I sometimes have the feeling the ice is alive. The ablation zone between the inviolate and the melting zones of the glacier is often sharply defined. Once past this point, the ice begins to die. Its melting can be hastened by even a faint increase in heat at the lower extremity, such as produced by the flash bulbs of hundreds of cameras. Ice field source of several major river systems, a storehouse of fresh water. The layers deep within the field may be hundreds of years old, formed from snow that fell here before the discovery of America, before the birth of Shakespeare, before the Industrial Revolution. Terminus. The terminus of the glacier is an instructive place, ceaselessly changing and yet always the same, like the seashore ice streams becoming rivers, mountains wearing down to valleys, the transition zone between two worlds. Orchids do not grow here, nothing grows here. The unceasing collision of ice and rock grinds away all life. Nothing can survive at the terminus. And yet, even now, I sometimes have the feeling the ice is alive. At the foot of the glacier, I halt again to catch my breath. I hear the faint creak of ice pinnacles nudged by the wind. Come with me. I want to show you something extraordinary. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, I'm going to read um, <clears throat> a couple of 
brief little anecdotes. There's there's a lot of stories within this story. There's a lot of um, uh, characters telling other characters tales um, or just stories just dropped in because I couldn't help myself. The more I learned and researched about the mountains, the more I loved, found all these lovely stories. And I just wanted to put a bunch of them into the book. So, and then of course, some of them are made up too. Um, and after 25 years, I'm not entirely sure which ones are which anymore. So anyhow, this first one is about uh, Lewis Swift, who was an actual historical character. He was one of the first white settlers in the Jasper area. He supposedly came to uh, Canada as a survivor of the Battle of Little Bighorn. And again, I'm not sure whether that's true or whether I made that up, but anyways. Um, so he is, he's established a, a sod roofed hut in the Athabasca Valley. He knows there are other people around, um, but he does, he's really sort of stayed away from them. And um, well, okay, I'll just read this part. His cabin was finished. By the next summer, he had broken land and planted wheat. He knelt one bright morning at the edge of his field and put his hand close to the earth, felt a cool rivulet of air being sucked along as though a giant were drawing breath. The fire appeared on the crest of the bare hill. Smoke dragged behind the rushing flames like a gray cape. The dry grasses exploded into black ash as the heat roared over them. The other men in the valley gathered at Swift's, shouting to each other through the thickening smoke. One man rode up in a hay wagon, reining in his two frantic draft horses. The others waved at him, pointed over his head, and he turned, saw the burden of fire he was carrying to them. The man jumped down and unhitched the horses. He took hold of their bridles, jerked their heads in the direction of the river, and slapped their flanks to start them galloping. Behind him, the burning wagon disappeared in its own smoke. Most of the women had gone down to the river with the children, although some came up to help, some came to help fight the fire. They fought for the rest of that day and into the night. Swift was seen wherever the flames were the most threatening, his shovel flying. They fought for three days and nights, resting when the many smaller fires seemed to be vanquished, digging furiously wherever they leapt to life again. On the morning of the third day, people from Arcturus Creek appeared on horseback. Sarah was with them. Sarah is one of the other main characters in the novel who was there before Swift shows up. They had wakened the day before to ash falling like gray snow and had come to offer their help. At midday, a gray twilight hung over the valley and from it, rain began to fall. The charred land steamed and hissed. The Blackbird brothers, the Mayettes, Finley and his wife Mistaya and Sarah gathered around the place where Swift stood pouring water from a leather flask over his head. Too exhausted to celebrate, they sat down together on the bare earth and looked into one another's smoke blackened faces without recognition. When Sarah got up to leave, she stumbled and fell to the ground. Swift's cabin was the nearest. He helped her to walk there, sat her down, and gave her a tin mug full of water. Then he cooked a meal of fried bread and potatoes. It's not my own bread, he said, not yet. While she ate, he stood at the open doorway, squinting out into the dusk. And when she was finished, he said, I still got some work. He placed a heavy black phonograph record on the Victrola, the tenor John Parkinson singing Che Gelida Manina from Puccini's La Boheme. That's a James Joyce allusion there for any of you James Joyce fans if you're out there. Uh, he asked Sarah to play the record again when it ended and to keep playing it until he returned. He took a shovel and he went out. In the dark, he was able to find the last of the embers, invisible in daylight, and smother them in earth. The smoke surrounded him and burned his eyes. He put a wet rag over his nose and mouth and found his way back to the cabin by the sound of the tenor's voice. Okay, how are we doing for time? Pretty good, is it time for one more? A little bit. Okay, all right. All right. Okay, so this is another one of the little stories that I dropped into the novel. And I'm pretty sure I made this one up, although 
over the years, it just seemed to me like something like this must have happened at some point in the mountains. Anyhow, <clears throat> eight local men haul a wing and sun piano up a lower spur of Mount Arcturus to the call known as the Stone Witch. Rawson is one of them. Hal Rawson is another of the main characters in the book. Uh, the avant-garde composer, Michel Barneau, has arrived in Jasper in 1920 to give the one and only performance of his Mountain Impromptu. Barneau's New York patrons have paid the carriers well to ensure that both composer and piano reach their destination intact. A reporter from the magazine Discord is also on hand to record the event. From the ridge, there is a vertical drop of over 700 feet into the Avernus chasm. Barneau wrote the piece without a definite ending. As he tells the reporter, it is finished when he decides it is finished. He plays for 27 minutes, bent over the keys with his eyes closed as if in pain. Then with the help of the carriers, he pushes the piano over the lip of the rock into the chasm. There is a brief crescendo of torrential chords as the wing and sun tumbles end over end, followed by the splintering of wood and a swiftly dimi diminishing rumble. The composer leans forward and watches without visible emotion as the shattered carcass of the piano slithers out of sight into the trees on the valley floor, trailing dust and tangled wire. When informed that the site of his composition was also that of a recent climbing casualty, Barneau is delighted. That night, townsfolk with torches search the floor of the chasm, looking to salvage some of the valuable materials from the wreckage. Ivory keys are found later in the summer by hikers alongside the Avernus Trail. Often, they are mistaken for the teeth of mammoths. Now, I don't think <laughs> that really happened, but not, not too long ago, I did hear about a, a composer in London, I think it was, who wanted to play the piano on the top of a, of a block of flats and then push the piano off the block, off the top of the block of flats to have it crash on the ground. And it was making some kind of statement about housing in London or something like that. But it didn't happen because the people who lived in the building said, we don't want you pushing a piano off our building. So uh, that never happened. But, you know, you can see it, it's sort of like one of those things that's like, yeah, it had to happen sooner or later. Somebody had to try something like that. So that's what I think. Have you finished reading, Tom? Yeah. yeah. Get out. Oh, <laughs> dude. OK, thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Waiting for more. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, oh, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to keep sure. an eye on the chat. So if anybody uh, has a question they want to ask, they can put it in the chat. Or you can, of course, just put up your hand and speak. That's totally um, terrific. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the chat. No, I guess you haven't, Tom, but there's a couple okay. people who are saying great things about the work. So um, Paulette says, I really love that last line. What a mantra for a writer, for anyone out in nature. Bravo, mon ami. Um, I said, I love that last line too. I absolutely do. I want to show you something extraordinary. I love the echo of that. Smaro uh, has said, uh, I've lost track of how many times I've read and taught this novel and I never tire of it. It continues to delight me and fill me with awe. And then Clara says, I hear tell you spent some time with an astronaut because of ice fields. How did that come about? And what was it like to meet a real life astronaut? Oh, okay. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, that happened around 2008. Uh, Ice Fields was chosen as one of the books for Canada Reads. And the person who chose it was uh, Steve McLean, the Canadian astronaut. And the reason he did was uh, he had gone up to space twice, he'd, and, you know, to the International Space Station, I think, or some iteration thereof. And he had seen the Columbia Ice Fields on both trips. And on the first trip, it uh, was immense. And then the second time he went years later, he could see that it had shrunk quite a bit. And he was startled to see how much the, the ice field had shrunk. So when he came back down, he was in an airport and he saw Ice Fields, the book on the shelf. And because the Columbia Ice Fields was on his mind, he picked up the book and he read it and he thought, yeah, this 
it's kind of resonates with what I've been thinking. Um, so that's why he chose the novel for, for Canada Reads. And uh, um, I, I mean, I was totally thrilled and I just thought it was so great that it was somebody from the sciences, you know, who was, who was defending the book. And uh, so then New West Press invited Steve to come to, to Jasper. Uh, and we did a, we did a talk in um, the Jasper, at the Jasper uh, Rec Center there. We, we talk, uh, did a talk, Steve and I, and uh, another fellow who's a glaciologist, I've forgotten his name now. Um, and, you know, this is one of the first times I'd ever seen or been part of uh, a public discussion about climate change. And, you know, there were a lot of worried, concerned people, people or, or you know, also people who were like, you know, what is this? It's, you know, it's, uh, is, it, is this really real? And, and so on and so forth. And um, so that was fascinating to, to, to be part of that. Uh, and then we took Steve up onto the Athabasca Glacier. So we got to hike up there with one of the park naturalists who took us, took us up onto the glacier and uh, got to ask him all kinds of astronaut questions. Like, what do you, what do you do if you have to sneeze? inside your, your uh, space helmet and then it blocks your view. Well, his answer is kind of gross. You have to use your tongue. <laughs> so, um, anyways, he, uh, he was uh, delightful and we enjoyed his company. And, and you know, you can, tell, you can tell when somebody should be an astronaut because this guy was, had nerves of steel. He was the most calm, calm, you know, collected, relaxed guy. He talked about some of the weird, awful things that had happened to him up in space and how he had to keep his cool. So I was just like, yeah, that's not something I could ever do. I, you know, I don't have the nerves for something like that. But um, yeah. Okay, thanks <laughs> for that. Um, Bertrand says, I love how many of the characters are as slippery in quotation marks as the ice in this novel. You think you can peg them down and then get a new insight. Uh, mm -hmm. Siobhan says, I'm recalling a tourist making a reading recommendation to you one day in Jasper. Does that make, is that That's not ringing any bells. Oh, 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 yes, yeah, okay, that's right. Somebody who had read ice fields and I met them on a hike or something. And uh, so we got to talking about Jasper and they told me that I should read this book called Ice Fields because it was really, <laughs> really good. So I never told this person who I was and I, I had a, a good time kind of just sort of going along with it without letting them know. Yeah, so that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Claire says, uh, I think this is relating to the story about licking snot off the inside of a space helmet. Claire says, this is why I'll never go to space. Yes. I, have a, I have a question. I have a question for you. So I am so curious. Um, so you made some change, you, you mentioned tweaks here and there, and you made some changes in this edition that weren't in the original edition. And so without getting into too many spoilers, can you talk about what you changed or what might've motivated any changes or tweaks that you made? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, mostly it was just little things that had, had always kind of bugged me uh, when I first wrote it. And uh, for me, dialogue was really difficult when I started out. When, when, when the book, when I first handed it into New West um, to see if they would publish it, it was about half, as, half the length that it became. And, the, and it was most of what ended up be, being the, uh, filling it out was dialogue because uh, Rudy Weeb was my editor. And when he got the manuscript, that was almost the very first thing he said to me was, uh, you have to have these characters talk to each other <laughs> because I had avoided doing that because I, 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 you know, I didn't think I had the skill to, to write dialogue. So I knew that was what I was gonna have to do. So I started, I, I started writing dialogue, but I also started writing dialogue in my, in my journal where I said, okay, this isn't gonna be in the book so it can, the characters can say whatever they want. They can talk and talk and talk and talk. And it was out of that sort of rough dialogue stuff that I often plucked things that I then went and put in the novel. Um, but sometimes the wording was, you know, yeah. After I published it, I would read that. I, I would go to a reading, do a reading, and I'd read a, uh, a piece of dialogue and it would just sort of grate on my ears for one reason or another. So I'd always thought if I ever get a chance, I want to fix all those little 
little things. And so that that's mainly what it was all about was making the characters sound, I guess, more like themselves, like things that they would actually really say. Uh, was the main thing. Because I guess I, I think I had gotten to know them better as the years went by. Even after you write a book, years later, you think about your characters and sometimes you get these insights like, oh, yeah, that's kind of why they are the way they are, right? It's not always something that you can see at first. So, so with that with that benefit of years of kind of thinking over who these characters were, I was able to go back in and, and sort of try to make them sound a little bit more like themselves. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. That's so interesting. Um, uh, I'll just read more of the chat questions. Tom, sure. uh, so Smaro says, uh, asks Tom, talk about the egg stone, the egg in quotation marks stone. Oh, should I? Because uh, that might be one of those spoilers. <laughs> It's right near the end of the book. Oh, okay. and that's that's a new edition, right? The, yeah, the, I, I changed uh, the scene right near the very end of the book. I changed the scene. Uh, in, in this scene, uh, Elspeth gives Byrne a rock. And she says that a little boy found it on the till plane by the glacier and he gave it to me, she says. And you should put it back where it belongs, right? I, I don't want to keep it. It should go back where it belongs. So she gives him the rock and he takes it back to the, the uh, glacier and puts it back. Um, and I'd always, you know, I, I always thought something else is going on here. And I, the author, don't know what it is. Right? Why, why is she giving this rock? What does it mean? Uh, and then in the revisions of the new edition, it struck me, you know, it's just like one of those moments, oh, now I see what the rock means. And so I was able to work that into the end of the book. And so, like I say, I don't want to give anything away, but the rock now uh, has a kind of importance for the characters, right? There's something about the characters that the rock symbolizes. Um, so, yeah, that's this. This is the director's cut, right? the author's cut, <laughs> and I, and I get to add these little things. So it's fun. Um, William asks, how has your interest in environmental issues figured into your other books? Hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I guess it's always there. Maybe, maybe because I started with a book like this, which is kind of about, you know, a place that's in danger of disappearing. Um, so maybe that's why that, that, that was always kind of on my mind in, in, in my other books. Um, but yeah, and it, I mean, it's just always been a part of my life too, right? Like uh, growing up in a place as beautiful as, as Alberta, um, how can one not look at this natural beauty and, and the, the things we have that so many other countries don't have or had but don't have anymore uh, because they've gotten rid of them in the, in the sort of rush for progress. Uh, so that to me has always been something that, that um, I care about and, and I want to put into my work. It's, it's, it's kind of taken over the new book, the one that I'm just finishing now, just revising now, the new, the new novel. Um, I, I think in a way I've kind of come to a point where this new book says everything I want to say uh, about, you know, about, about the environment, environment and about nature. And maybe Ice Fields was kind of a, yeah, just a sort of prelude to that in some ways. Yeah. When's, so when's that new book coming out and what is, what, what's the title? Uh, it's called The Book of Rain and it's uh, being published by Penguin Random House Canada in 2023. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Claire uh, says, by happenstance, my book club just read Tay John. And I know you and Smaro touched on that being a book that Icefields connects with. I'm always interested in how books converse with one another. How did you find yourself conversing with Tay John while writing Ice Fields? Or did the conversation come after during the editing process or while reflecting on the novel you'd written? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Uh, I think with Tay John, I was looking for any books I could find that were fiction, I mean, like novels, fiction, short stories that were set in the place that I wanted to write about. And there really were not very many, you know? Uh, the, the, the literature of, of the Rockies of this part of the world, there, there still aren't that many novels and, and uh, short fiction. So, I mean, it's changing, it's growing, and, and that's great to see. But, but back then, 
I was looking for models and, and it was like there were almost no models. But here was this, this book, Taejon, which had just been recently, I think, re, you know, reprinted in a kind of Canadian library. You know, there's that Canadian library of, of paperbacks that came out in the 70s, I think it was. And Taejon was one of them. And it had an afterword by Michael Ondaatje, and he had a lot of good things to say about the book. Um, when I read it, I honestly didn't like, <laughs> like it all that much. I thought it was kind of like Tarzan goes to the Rockies in some ways. Uh, it's, it's a strange, strange book um, with some very sort of over the top symbolism and, and things happening. Uh, fight, you know, fight, men fighting with grizzly bears and, and the main character chops his arm off at one point. And uh, so all sorts of grues, gruesome, weird things happen. Um, but I, I, I grew to appreciate it more as, as I worked on my own novel. And I, I, I saw, you know, kind of things that I was doing kind of reflected in, in that book. And I felt like I was having a bit of a conversation with it. I know that I, in Icefields, I do mention somewhere in the book, I mention um, the author himself. I can't remember where that is, but I think he's one of the guys who works for Trask at the uh, chalet. Um, because uh, uh, Howard O'Hagan, the author of Tejon, lived in Jasper. He was the son of the town doctor, and he was a hiker, climber, guide, all of that sort of thing before he became a writer. Yeah. So in, in that sense, he was a model for me too, right? This was somebody who had lived here in Jasper and became a writer. So that was important to me too. Yeah. That's so yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I, I, I kind of want to go back to that uh, your, uh, when you were talking about the changes and tweaks that you made for this edition, like what a gift that is. But I'm curious about what was, you know, what was the sensation of going back and reading your first book after so many, after two decades, you know? So what, what, was, mm -hmm. what was that like? Were you, you know, you can make tweaks, but you sure can't change Things substantively. So was that a, a pleasant experience? Was it different? Like, can you just talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I was mainly thinking about the writer in a funny kind of way, right? Because 25 years later, I'm not the same person I was then. Uh, you know, I can look back at the book and I can see, I can remember the kind of person I was when I wrote it. And I, and I, and I had to laugh that this writer was so obsessed with glaciers and and there's you know stuff about ice and glaciers on on nearly every page, <laughs> uh, so it brought it brought all of that back. You know, it's 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 something that, for whatever reason, I'm one of those writers who, in order to finish a book, I have to get totally obsessed with something, right? So to the point where I can't leave it alone. Um, in, in the case of of, of ice fields, it was obsession with Jasper and with glaciers and so on. Um, uh, with with the new book I'm writing right now, it's it's an obsession with animals and birds, especially birds. Um, so I, for, for some reason, I need to I need to get into that obsessive mode in order to get the energy, I guess, to get a book finished. So so uh, that that was certainly the case with ice fields, right? It's it like I say, it it I was dropping mountain lore and research and history and legends in there just because I was so fascinated by it all, I couldn't stop myself, right? Um, I'm sure there must have been some stuff that we edited out at, at some point because there was too much of it. But uh, so that was that was my main impression was um, how fascinating it is to read this book and feel like it was written by somebody else, because in a sense it, it was right. So, yeah. Hmm. Um, we have about is this an hour long reading? OK. Okay, so I'm just assuming it's an hour long reading. Um, if mm -hmm. anybody has any other questions, please put them in the chat. But Tom, I kind of felt like your reading ended prematurely. So can okay. you can you read the passage with the angel? Oh, okay. Just, just the, for me. I don't think sure. it's a, I don't think it's a spoiler because it's no. so early in the book. Sure. Happy Thank to. You, you Thank bet. You. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna. It's kind of spread out over uh, a couple of sections. Yeah, okay, I'll start here. Here we go. So Dr. Byrne has fallen into this crevasse. This was a, a real event actually that happened on a real expedition. 
Um, Byrne himself is fiction, I made him up, but this event did actually happen on one of the real expeditions to the uh, ice fields, except for the angel part, <laughs> I should add, as far as I know. Uh, he knew that the sun must have broken through the swath of cloud hanging over the glacier. Somehow its light had found a way into the depths of the crevasse. The ice wall in front of him became lit with a pale blue-green radiance. At first, he felt only anger at himself and the others. Far above him, Professor Cauley, Stuckfield, Thompson, Trask would be welcoming the sunshine while it lasted, unwinding the scarves from around their necks, taking off their thick gloves, glorying in that sudden benediction of light. A rest from the dull overcast sky and the stinging crystalline shards streaming off the neve. And while they sunned themselves, he was trapped here because of his own stupidity, upside down, freezing to death. He struggled to move, to turn his head and shout upward. Still, he felt no pain, nothing. And then horror, I've broken my neck. He moved his arms, his legs, they still obeyed him. It was the cold that was numbing him and the shock of his fall. His spine was not broken. The others would find him. They would free him and he would have a wonder to report to Collie, a hitherto unknown periscopic property of glacial ice. He stared straight ahead and realized he could see quite far into the ice. It was almost free of impurities, like a wall of furrowed tinted glass. He squinted. There was something in the ice, a shape, its outline sharpening as the light grew. A fused mass of trapped air bubbles or a vein of snow had formed a chance design a white form embedded within the darker ice and revealed by the light of the sun. A pale human figure with wings. The white figure lay on its side, the head turned away from him. Its huge wings were spread wide, one of them cracked obliquely near the tip, the broken pinions slightly detached. One arm was also visible, outstretched in the semblance of some gesture that Byrne felt he had seen before, but could not interpret. A remembered sculpture, or one of Blake's hovering, pitying spirits. The shape gleamed wetly, like fine porcelain or delicately veined marble. Byrne groped for his notebook, but found he could not reach around to the side pocket of his rucksack. His other arm was stuck fast, dead, he struggled, gasping against the pressure on his chest that would not allow him to fill his lungs. Pain awoke, tearing through his neck and shoulder. I'm alive. He held himself still, clamped his jaw against a rising screen. He was suddenly aware that any movement could send him plummeting deeper into the crevasse. He was thirsty. He scraped at the ice wall with his one free hand, pressed his fingers to it until he felt them burn, then held them in his mouth. His head and chest pounded with a dull throb of pain that he realized was his own heartbeat. He had to think, keep his mind working and alert. What would the orientation of this artifact be if he were not looking at it upside down? Had it fallen from above or seeped in from below? Did the ice encasing it cause a magnifying effect? It seemed to be very large, large enough if it suddenly stirred to life and flowed towards him through the ice to surround him and enfold him with its wings. He closed his eyes. When he looked again, the light had faded. The ice wall was blank. He laughed. It was absurd, a magnificent, impossible figure from a long forgotten childhood dream. There. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, that was just fabulous. Um, Thank you. That's one of my favorite parts, absolutely. And it stays with me all the time. Um, mm -hmm. I, there are no more questions unless people have questions, but I just want to uh, repeat that if you want to purchase a landmark edition of Ice Fields in Edmonton or Calgary, please click below in the chat. Um, and at this point, I think Tom would be signing, but we can't do that. 
Um, so please join me in thanking Thomas Wharton for this wonderful launch. Thank you. Thank you. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free. I'm not sure if you have any final remarks, Tom, or. I, I don't know. I saw something pop up there just a minute ago. Oh, okay. From, from Claire, but I, I wasn't sure if that was a question or. Yes. So Claire says, I always wondered if it's a reference to Bradbury's something wicked this way comes. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Not that I know of, but if if you want to read it that way, that's fine. I, mean, I was just reading it today, the section from my book club book again, the ah. next book we picked. And there's a woman trapped the gaps in a block of ice. It's the most beautiful woman in the world. And I was like, oh, is Tom? <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, that's okay. It's just a wonderful coincidence. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I guess I've never read that. I mean, I've read lots of Bradbury, but I, I can't believe I haven't read that. But I mustn't have read it. But otherwise, I would have remembered something like that. Wow. Yeah, that's great. I gotta, go, I gotta go find that. Absolutely. Perfect time of the year to read it, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And right. Kate, Kate says, um, thank you for this wonderful event. And I look forward to your new book. Claire says, thanks, Tom. William says, thanks, Tom. I was glad to hear so many familiar lines from the book. And Smarrow says, congrats, Tom. Oh, thank you oh, so much, everyone. Oh, Winston, yeah. oh, there's more, there's more. Winston says, I just wanted to say that I'm delighted to have been here for the reissue of this book and also to see you, Suzette. Hello, don't know if you'd remember me, but I was promotions coordinator at New West when both Icefields and Moon Honey were published. Just delighted to hear you reading. <laughs> oh, great cool. to see you. Elizabeth says, fabulous, riveting readings and good, interesting questions. Thank you so much. And Siobhan says, thank you for this wonderful evening and sharing my favorite novel ever and also place in the world. Lovely. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out to the reading. Yeah. And Paulette says, Thank excellent reading. I was there when you read it in Jasper in 1995, and I learned something new today. You lucky guy to have the chance to tweet. Smiley face. I don't know what that means. Is that an inside joke? I'm not sure. I but I remember when in 1995, when I read the book, I, I probably read it like this. Oh, OK. I oh. my face behind the tweet. <laughs> She says, no, not tweet, tweak. Okay. Okay, I thought, oh, this is, something, this is something the kids are saying. I wasn't sure what was going on. All right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks, Tom, and thank you, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Suzette, for uh, hosting, wonderful hosting. Oh, yeah. You. It's an honor.